Ding-a-ling-ling, is that the ad bell? He's here to tell you about Sci Guys Live in London on the 26th of September at Jamboree, which you can watch online if you want to, live streamed, or you can actually come in person and watch our little faces. And it's only a week away. That's just one week until you can see our faces in person or on screen and our special guest and get involved with the live podcast, the Q&A, the meet and greet, the interactive quickfire quiz and the brand new never seen before merch. Is there anything else, Luke? Will it just be us? Who else is going to be there? Oh, Chanel Williams, our special guest that I just mentioned at the start of that list. Did you mention her by name? <laughs> I think not, which is why I prompted you. Anyway, so go get your tickets at sideguys.co.uk forward slash tickets with a 20% discount for patrons. Shall we start the show? Mm, I want to say sideguys.co.uk forward slash tickets just one more time and now we can start the show. What if I want to say sideguys.co.uk? Well, Let's then I'll cut the, it and it's not going to go. Start the show. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host Luke Cutforth and this week's special guest, Jessica Kelgren Fozar. Hi, thank you for having me. This week we're talking about a method of raising rapscallions invented by an Italian. But first, we have a YouTube comment. This one says, I like how Corey says gaming as a single word. <laughs> I like that too. So I've got a question for everyone who's watching or listening or perhaps even on the podcast. The question is, do you have or want kids? Oh, yes. And no and yes. I don't have secret kids. <laughs> That's a- very interesting way of answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I do have one currently. Um, I have a two-year-old, Rupert, um, and I would love more. <laughs> Sorry, for a second, I was like, you would love more Ruperts. Yeah, more children. Yes, <laughs> that is the, that's where that's going, yeah. More Ruperts, yeah, exactly. Just tiny mini clones. <laughs> uh, all identical. That is possible with technology nowadays, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about the Montessori method. So, a second question for everyone. Luke, you might not know the answer to this, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what is Montessori? Ooh, is it something to do with like gentle parenting? Well, they're they're not dissimilar, but not exactly. Perhaps our guest might give us uh, mm. a slightly more in-depth answer than yours, Luke. Yeah, so interestingly, uh, gentle parenting and Montessori parenting do often go hand in hand, but they're not exactly the same thing. Um, gentle parenting is a style of parenting and Montessori is a style of education that can also be applied to your parenting and how you do things in your home. But it's actually Montessori. Most people, when I mention that that's the style of parenting we do at home, that that's the kind of education we do with our son. People think, oh, that's that's really new, right? That came around what, in the 90s. And it actually comes all the way back from the early 1900s. People are like, what? That's, that's incredible. I had no idea. Um, and it's really based on some simple practices that are around the child. So it's focused on the... Uh, the independence of the child is very child-led, child-driven, and we believe that left to themselves, a child will follow their own path to education, that we all have an innate drive for knowledge. And we don't need to kind of sit children down and, and force knowledge into them. Like, do you remember when you were a small child and you just had that burning passion for something, whatever it was, whether it was dinosaurs or trains or my son's currently obsessed with sticker books like it's just his great love like he's he's got to do hundreds and hundreds of sticker books mainly about like the dress up doll ones loves them he's got to know all their names as well has to name everything um you have that love for something and you really can construct your understanding and learning of the world around your great passions and your great loves and it's that's the kind of the basis of it is taking that love of learning and really helping to build upon that Mm. in those early years Mm. and making things so that they 
um, suit the child. So having things be child sized rather than hmm. having it yes. be always an adult who's helping the child to do things, having things be instead, you know, he's very, he's very independent. He will, uh, he spills his drink, he, he gets his cloth and he wipes it up. And it's, it's giving that child a sense of purpose, a sense of self and a sense of independence. Oh, absolutely. And to hop back to what you said sort of at the beginning, you were saying people think it's from the 90s. I would say the 1890s wouldn't be terribly incorrect. <laughs> um, the 1990s, definitely not. But the 1890s is probably closer. And yeah, what you were saying about that sort of passion for learning, you know, when I was reading about this, I kept on thinking about how it relates to Psy Guys, you know, in that for me, I really loved learning. I did enjoy school uh, because I found school quite easy until I didn't <laughs> because of ADHD. I would just ignore the subjects I didn't like and just really dive into the ones that I did. It just so happened that those were all of the sciences, which was very lucky. But Psy Guys is now that sort of very much just follow your passions for learning, like really getting people to enjoy the process of learning rather than caring about sort of grades and these sort of sort of sort of check marks that you need to get to you know it's really I, I feel like Montessori um sort of the Montessori method of sort of education is more similar to what we talk about on Psy Guys uh than you know what people would normally be used to in standard education so you're saying that you Montessori parent yourself now Cory not just myself Luke also you and, and all of our all listeners <laughs> 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 there you go. That's that's kind of the beauty of it, right? Is that when I was in primary school, I thought it was so pointless. Even as a child, I was like, "Why am I? Why am I here? What is the point of this? Why do we have to do these exams? Why do we have to do all of this? What is it for? What is the point of it?" And I, even in, as an adult now, I'm like, "Why do we put five year olds through exams? What, why?" <laughs> Right. And is this meant to be a reflection of the real world? Because it isn't. It's not like they, we sit down and we do an exam every four months. I mean, do you do that in your daily life? Well, at the end of every episode of Sci Guys, I do a quick fire quiz. So I kind of do get tested a little bit, Jessica. But in the rest of my <laughs> life, no. But Cory is a, a brutal teacher. Um, he's, he's got a cane. Mm -hmm. He uses in the in, after we finish the show. See, Luke says this, and yet I don't want to use the cane. He tells me I have to. This is <laughs> this is this is not coming from me. But speaking of the cane, that does remind me of sort of Victorian schools, yeah. which is what our sort of mo model of education is based on right now. And so, yeah, no, we are not sitting down and um, doing exams all the time as adults, but teaching children to stay in line and follow the rules and sit down and step straight and be good and all of those sort of things was very useful when you wanted children to learn some stuff and then go work, you know, in the workhouse or the mines or uh, wherever, it, wherever it was they sent people. It's sort of like when you try to break a horse, what? but we're just doing that to all the children. Oh, when you say break a horse, I, I hear, you know, like <laughs> snap a horse's leg. I'm, I feel like that's not what you want to do with your race horses. That's the opposite. Break in a horse. Is that what it is? It's not break a horse. Yeah, you have to break them in. Ah, like a pair of shoes. This is why I keep having all my horses <laughs> confiscated. Ah, oh, goodness me. Yeah, this is God, so where you've been horses. going wrong this whole time. <laughs> Here we go. Like the education as we have it now is originally set up to create amazing little worker bees, but mm. that's not the job market that we have nowadays. And as the job market has changed, as the world has changed, we should have education that keeps up with it. We should mm. have a more innovative style of creating children who are driven by passion, who are full of confidence in being innovative, creating new ideas, going after their passions because, you know, a lot of our world now is based in things like technology mm -hmm. and we need that to be constantly innovating. And to do that, we need people who feel confident and proud of their ideas. A lot of Montessori, especially in the early years, like I have a two-year-old, so obviously my experience is mainly in that kind of like naught to two, naught to three bracket so far, is about just building confidence it's just about making them feel really like proud of themselves 
and really good in that sense of, yeah, I'm an independent human being and I can do this stuff myself. And a lot of that's like not correcting them when they make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So like he does his own clothes and if it's scruffy and messy, you're just like, yep. It sort of reminds me of, um, a, I read a lot about Adlerian psychology. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, Jessica, but it's it's sort of about the, the parenting aspect of Adlerian psychology is something to do with um respecting the child as an as an independent person and not just doing everything for them allowing them to make their mistakes and not scolding them for their mistakes but also not just fixing their mistakes for them um, but sort of creating a safe environment for them to make mistakes uh, and and for them to learn on their own and sort of not encroaching on their learning process and it sounds like this has some some kind of overlap there which is really interesting should we dive into maybe a little bit more of the sort of history of Montessori and maybe a little bit more about what it actually is? So in front of me here, what I've got in my notes is what I kind of wanted to start with is essentially that when we say Montessori, we're talking about a lot of things because there is the the very strict sort of um, original uh, Montessori method, shall we call it. And then because you can't really trademark that, you can't copyright that, it's just someone's name, um, anyone can slap Montessori on to their school without actually following the methods really very closely. And that's not to say that every single Montessori school you see is a scam, that's not what I'm saying at all, but there's more of a sort of spectrum of these sort of places out there now. But when you look at this more sort of... Um, traditional Montessori, let's say, the sort of, you know, more adhering to the values of it, um, you see a lot of really interesting things, which we'll hopefully get into. But um, do you know, perhaps, Luke, who it was that created the Montessori method? Well, I'm going to guess by what you just said, it was <laughs> someone called... Um, oh, actually, okay, so I, I, can't, I, I was going to say Mr. Montessori, but maybe it was Miss Montessori or Mrs. Montessori. I'm just used to the uh, the, the the people who do things in history uh, that we actually remember because they're written down by someone being men, because that's just disappointingly the way the world is. But I'm going to say Mrs. Montessori. Is it Mrs. Montessori? I believe it's Miss Montessori, actually. Oh, Miss Montessori. Oh, God, yeah, sorry. That's the one I didn't cover. She was unmarried. Woke legend, thank you. Yeah, she's actually doctor. Oh, we're both Oh my wrong. gosh, you're so ha, right, no! Ha, 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 ha. Thank you, Jessica, for regaining some of my uh, glory. I literally have that sat in front of me. Wow. <laughs> Sexism. It really, it, it gets you, doesn't put, it? Put honour on her name. Um, she, <laughs> yeah, she, a lot of her ideas came from working with children uh, who were in very underprivileged spaces in uh, in Italy mm -hmm. and had been sent to, um, I mean, they, the words that they used at that time were not words that we would use now. We will call them asylums now. But um, yeah, so children who had been, had been decided, these were children who would never amount to anything, children who would never mm. be able to uh, live normal lives, in air quotes. Um, because there was something wrong with them. And through her work with them, she was able to um, notice things about them, notice how maybe they didn't all do so well in the systems that had been attempted to be forced upon them, but mm. there way, were ways in which they could be um, provided for a new learning environment, something that they did really flourish in and develop from and having things, very simple practical life activities, whether it was just his shoe shining station, which um, is a thing that they still do now. Like my son shines his shoes at school. It's very really? sweet. Um, whether it was just simple buttoning and unbuttoning activities, it helped connect things in these children's brains and they could build upon these skills until slowly they started to really be able to develop into um, using these, these small skills into larger things that we would think of as being like academic 
skills. Mm -hmm. It was just a new way of looking at things. So in Montessori, they use a lot of the, what we call like practical life techniques, whether that's you know, pouring your water into a glass and then learning to drink it, or we do like broad brush stroke painting and things will work up to um, putting pegs into slots and that works up to holding a pencil and then you're writing and then you're you know developing on and on and on and it's really not skipping out on those things that people think of as being inconsequential. No, absolutely. I feel like what people forget is that some things may be easy for some people, but for others, they need to break those things down into different steps. And in a, in a very different, I mean, the same thing, but in a slightly different way. With ADHD, for example, for me, let's say something as simple as brushing my teeth, right? Most people will see brushing one's teeth as... Okay, what are the steps to brushing your teeth? You you get your toothbrush, you get your toothpaste, and then you brush your teeth. For me, that is, there are so many more steps to brushing my teeth that make it so difficult to, to just get out of bed and do that, where I've got to go to the bathroom, I've got to get my toothbrush, I've got to make sure that I'm paying attention for two whole minutes and getting every single bit and like not getting bored and not getting annoyed by the noise and all of these sorts of things. And something as simple as brushing your teeth could be very difficult for some people and that's not, you know, and, you know, people will have this idea that, oh, well, if it's difficult for you to do this, then it'll be difficult for you to do other things. You can't achieve this and that. I have a biotechnology degree. I went to one of the best universities in the country. I still struggle to brush my teeth because it's a difficult thing for me to do. That should be your Twitter bio. Twitter bio. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Maybe one day. Um, X bio now, look, I believe. Let's Sorry. Not, let's not dead name Twitter. <laughs> um, no, so... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, but back to uh, Dr. Maria Montessori. I, I want to talk a little bit about her because I find her really, really interesting. Um, she was born in um, 1870 in Italy, of course. But, you know, what people might not know is that she was one of the first people, uh, one of the first women in Italy to be a doctor. You know, um, she she had a very sort of uh, progressive family. Um, her mother apparently was really um, influential in all of this. Um, her father was supportive as well. Uh, but she she went to a technical uh, a technical school that was an all male technical school. She studied engineering and maths and then graduated in 1890 uh, when she was 20 years old. And then she went to a medical school. And that was at a point, um, you know, in the 1890s, wherein she was not allowed to enter um, any of the sort of rooms, the classrooms, when all of the men were in there. She had to wait for all of her male classmates to leave. And then she got to go into the classrooms. She wasn't allowed. Um, she, what was, there was something with the, the cadavers. That was it. She could only do the cadaver dissections um, after hours. So when there was no one else in the building, all the other students had gone that's when she gets to start dissecting the cadavers. She was really, she was really going through it. And the fact that, you know, she went through all of that, got a medical degree, and then went on to, you know, create this revolutionary method of education is incredible. And when I said she was Miss, I wasn't just being sexist. I wasn't just being sexist. I was also alluding to the fact that she chose not to marry. Um, she actually uh, fell pregnant. She had a child, um, a son, her only son, Mario, not of Super Mario Brothers fame, unfortunately, uh, different Mario. Uh, she sent him to live with a family on a farm. Uh, you know, they fostered him for, you know, un until he was a teenager because she was like, well, look, if I have this kid, I'm gonna have to get married. And if I get married, then I'm not gonna be able to have my career and I want to have my career. So she, you know, fostered her child and then came back and they reunited when he was 17. And, you know, you might think, oh, what a what a callous thing for a mother to do. First off, sexist. No. Um, second off, <laughs> they had a great relationship. They worked together uh, later in life. So, you know, I mean, this was all not only was she a fantastic doctor, a great educator. Uh, she's also a good mum, apparently, as well, which is really, which is really nice to see. Because so often when you see um, these scientists talking about all of these things, they're usually men and they're usually horrible to everyone else around them. I mean, remember, we did, we did an episode of, a few months back. There was a scientist that was really influential and I think he cheated on every single one of his wives. He had four ex-wives. Not a good guy. Luckily, this person seems to be quite nice. <laughs> but yeah, so she ended up basically just leaving um, medicine altogether. She stopped um, 
sort of practicing that med- or studying medicine, studying medicine uh, to really focus on this sort of Montessori education, say the Montessori education, uh, on her sort of new sort of um, style of education. She started off working with, uh, as Jessica said, she started off working with underprivileged kids, a lot of them, I mean, a lot of them with mental disabilities and ended up getting them to a point of um, kind of matching their peers academically in that getting into primary schools where, um, you know, they would not have been expected to. Um, and in some cases, you know, um, having similar sort of academic results to other children, which, you know, at that period of time, bear in mind, 18, sort of 1890s, 1900s, um, that was, that. If, you, if we think about how we treat, you know, sort of disabled people in general now, uh, particularly people with sort of mental disabilities, it was a lot worse a hundred years ago. Like that's, incredibly groundbreaking um and she really she really was just pushing this stuff forward as you said jessica you know um getting things to be child-sized which seems so normal now you know but it just wasn't then you know getting things that they could actually hold with their hands that fit them chairs and desks that were the right size and all of these sorts of things um and there were these things um maybe jessica could uh, better explain but basically these sort of interactive um, tactile manual things to help kids sort of learn. Yeah, so we we call them materials. So they're things that, I mean, so when you said that Maria Montessori kind of stopped practicing medicine, I think in many ways she continued because we can think of what she continues to theorize on and the thoughts that she had as being very much still in the the scope of studying the brain like she had many theories that we now know were then proven by things like brain scans she Mm. theorized that the human brain doesn't stop growing and actually reach maturity until you're 24 Mm -hmm. which we now know through brain scans to be true so her idea about the planes of development um not to three three to six um six to twelve twelve to I'm not great at this, um, but then they're going on until until they're 24, and then how we need to conceptualize and think of our children as continuing to be children until they're 24 and, and still looking after them in that way. And she created these materials that were suited to different ages and were very much tactile and and hands on and how it would work best with a child's learning to really be putting their hands on like numbered, putting their hands on beads to be learning about your numbers, Mm -hmm. to to hold it in your hands, really thinking about it in that way, rather than just let's sit children in rows and have them recite their times tables. And that will definitely sink it in their heads. Every single one of them will be able to understand it in this way, because we all know now that we all learn differently. And the Mm -hmm. joy of Montessori is that we know that everyone learns differently and that we all have our different strengths um and you were talking about um adhd earlier and Mm. as someone with adhd myself like that's one of the reasons i was really driven to it as a as a parent is that i love i would have loved to have had montessori education myself because we all have such different brains right and the idea that you can follow your your interest and your passion, and we don't need to be these amazing all-rounders. We can really find the way that we learn best and then build on that, I think is really great. And Montessori was really ahead of her time in that respect. I think ahead of the ahead of the time is is it even encapsulated it entirely. Um, you know, especially what you were saying up top at the start of the episode, people thinking this is from the 90s. It makes sense because it does come off as that very sort of 90s, oh, it's it's happening in California, it's happening in, you know, in sort of upstate New York, It's this is the new trend. Very much seems like that sort of thing, you know, but no, this is all based on, you know, someone actually working with lots of different children. And I've got a few, a, a few quotes from her, but um, one is, I'm certain that my ideas, which are founded only on love for the children, will find a good welcome. And I think that's the key point, that this is really child-focused. I mean, that's one of the main sort of key tenets of, um, you know, Montessori, is that it is child-focused. It's about the education of the child. And in a lot of ways, it's about the child sort of taking 
ownership of their own education, knowing that it's about them rather than being about, you know, this sort of mold that we all need to fit into. Because, I mean, if we talk about normal schooling, you know, our sort of standard school system now, it very much is, here is, here is the template um, and everyone else must try to reach that template. If you fit the template very well, then you get lots of good grades. You get lots of nice things happening to you. If you don't fit the template very well, then we're not going to do very much to help you. We might have maybe a, a class for learning skills. We might have maybe a, a teacher's aide in the room, but we're not really going to do very much to make your education actually all that good. And I mean, not to toot our own horn, but I do want to say that like, this is something that we see on Sci Guys. You know, we get people messaging us, sending us emails in the comments as well, you know, letting us know, hey, I didn't like this subject. I thought I hated science. I thought I hated school. I thought I hated learning. But, you know, from listening to the podcast, I realized, oh, I just didn't like how school tried to teach me things. I mean, someone emailed us the other day to say that they went, they completely changed their mind on what they were going to do. They're not going to be a marine biologist. Yeah, they've gone on to study that because they listened to the podcast. They were like, oh, actually, I like this, but that's, school made me think I didn't. That's freaky. That's too much responsibility. I really hope that goes well for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, just when the dolphins are attacking, you can blame us. OK, that's that one's probably going to be on us. But uh, <laughs> no, um, I guess the the main point is that sort of it it's really about the children. It's really about focusing on each individual child and I mean, understanding that they are individuals. Um, and another quote, um, because just just very briefly, um, just a brief delve into fascism here. Of course, she was living through the time of she was living through the time of Mussolini, who really liked her for a while, and then suddenly did not like her when he realized that she wouldn't just fall in line with you know indoctrinating children uh, into fascism, yeah, and he then he kind that. of dropped her. Um, and during World War II, she ended up in um, India, where she was detained for a while because she was Italian. Um, and then, was it World War II? Sorry, World War I. One. World War One. Yes, I think it's World War I. Oh no, it's World War Two. World War Two. yeah, World War II. We're both wrong. We don't do history. This is a science <laughs> podcast. But, um, so during World War II, she was in um, India. And yeah, so she was detained there for a while, but then they were, she was released and she stayed there until the war ended. She influenced uh, Nobel laureate, um, I should have read this name before, Rabindranath Tagore. Um, and that's where that quote came from. The, the quote I said earlier, I'm certain that my ideas, which are founded only on the love for the children, will find a good welcome. That was in a letter to that Nobel laureate. Um, and then she also went on to say later on, uh, preventing conflicts is, a, is the work of politics. Establishing peace is the work of education, which again, you know, ahead of her time, this really seems like sort of stuff that we're still struggling to grasp um, as a society now, that education is so important. And making education about getting a job is insane. It's this weird little capitalist thing that none of us really think about, but it is kind of insane that, you know, the entire purpose of, you know, this thing that we send children to uh, from the age of sort of five to 17, 18, for 13-ish years of their lives, it's about making them good for a job rather than making them ready to face their lives. It's one of the reasons I would say is why you see many men entirely unable to cook for themselves. Yes, it's because you know, patriarchy and all that as well. But we should be being taught these things in school. We should be we should be being taught, you know, how to do these sort of things, these this sort of independence. And, you know, in Montessori schools, there there is this sort of thing. Um, I mean, especially sort of in the sort of original ones, where they would um sort of have the kids serve each other foods or clean up after themselves and whatnot. Like there was a whole there was that was sort of a big part of it. Like actual practical life skills like the, these little ones that you don't really think about yeah so in a good montessori school today we they very much still do that they mm. still cook for the class and they'll lay the table they all eat together they'll help each other out they will clean up after each other and they're very much still in that collaborative spirit and that kind of thing and i think it's really it is quite I think it is it is sort of sad the education system that we have, but we of course can't you know we can't um, can't blame teachers or the education system or anything like that because they they're trying their hardest and doing their best with the budget that they get given and every time the political system changes they get 
handed down some new thing and it's like, okay, we've now changed up your entire remit. This is what you have to do. And mm -hmm. teachers are like, oh, right, thanks so much. You've changed everything <laughs> again. Brilliant. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> which is the same for doctors. It's the same mm. for all kinds of public workers where every time they're handed something new, every time politicians change. And I think what we need is more of a, a higher level change. Yeah. Like a broader systemic change in the the population's idea of what education needs to be and then for the politicians to actually respond to that and for them to be like oh yeah we need to we need to actually change education to something that is really reflective of what young people need to know i totally agree you know i mean we very much love teachers i would say i teachers are to me just some of the best people on the planet because if you look especially in the US as well if you if you look at what they've got to deal with there's teachers that have to buy things for their like supplies for their class teachers really you know put their all into it and yes every every single one of us has probably had a teacher that you know we haven't quite got on with there are maybe a few that aren't great but do not let a teacher that you don't like sort of color your view of teachers as a whole because they're educating people. That is the most important thing ever. Literally the most important thing. We take these little people that are, you know, they're full people. They're just not able to regulate their emotions quite yet. They might not be quite as dexterous as they will be when they're adults. They're not able to understand certain things. They don't have all of this knowledge that we now have. But fundamentally, they are still people. And shaping young minds is the most thankless and most important job ever. Honestly, it's, it's so important. I just don't think that, you know, we give it the weight that it should have. And you're so right. It's, it's a total systemic change that's needed. I mean, maybe we should just talk quickly a little bit more about sort of, you know, the actual specifics of what a Montessori sort of school would look like, because it's something that I was quite surprised about when I, when I sort of, you know, looked into it, that there aren't sort of classes necessarily they're all sort of it, it seems to me they're all sort of mixed in together where there's the older ones helping the younger ones and they're all interacting and you know there's this whole thing about there being sort of three hour blocks rather than sort of 30 minute lessons where you kind of direct your own education you really get to be stuck into something for quite some time which I find really interesting. Sounds like a parallel universe. I've often had this like dream of like, I wonder what school would be like if there were just lessons being put on and you just went to the lesson you wanted to learn. Not that like that I wouldn't necessarily have gone to some of the important things that I should know, but like <laughs> just fundamentally changing the structure of how education works and have it be more led by your own interests and what that like how that would have ripple effects on like the the entirety of your life and uh, of society, right? Because, you know, I know that there are people who have, uh, like Steve Jobs, for example, talked about how he just didn't go to university. So he dropped out of university, but carried on going to the lessons that he wanted to go to. <laughs> and he went to a calligraphy class, which he never would have done on his degree. Mm. Um because he was just naturally interested in it. Um, and I've always wondered what life would be like if... The structure of education was different and that sounds like you're describing a very different educational structure which if then expanded out to a societal structure if everyone was in this system for example like society would be ent entirely different one would presume you're saying there that you wouldn't go to the classes that you don't think you'd be interested in mm. but if you've been in this system since the very start since you're a year and a half old don't you think that by the time you come to teenage years, you might be attending the classes that you would think of as like, oh, this is boring. This mm. is a class about long division. I don't know. Because <laughs> it's actually going to be really helpful for this other project that you're working on over here. So you've got mm. this passion mm. project that you're working on. You're like, I just can't get this bit. I just can't get this, this like tricky wheel. This, it's not turning quite correctly. I'm just not really getting it. I'm going to go to this class over here that's on this subject and I think it's going to give me the answer and help me learn how to do this. Okay. Mm. And that for some reason helps you, gives you the answer and you're like, brilliant. Okay, I've got it. 
then you can take that back to your project that you're working on and apply it. Absolutely. You're not necessarily just looking at a class list and going, oh, what sounds like a really interesting mm. thing that I would like to go to. You're thinking about it in terms of like, okay, I've got something that I'm really creatively building and working on myself because this, it's not, so it's, it's the way that, that the classes are generally structured mm. is from the very beginning, um, do you have like an infant's class, which will go from the age of about one and a half up to three, or well, sometimes it goes from two to three. Then you have a children's house, which goes from three-year-olds to six-year-olds. Then the elementary, which goes from six to 12. And it's quite rare for there to then be a high school uh, age group as well. But some schools do also have the, the high school kind of um, age group as well. And the way that classes are run is that you're right, there isn't generally a teacher who goes, now it is time for maths, let's go. And so they have a three hour working period. So the children enter the classroom, they say hello and greet their teachers. Then things are laid out around the class, which might be um, in my son's classroom, he'll have things that would be like some puzzles and coin slot boxes. He'll have um, shoe shining stations. He'll have a place to do some painting, things where he can cut up pieces of paper to work on his scissor skills. Um, the older kids love doing some baking. So they have li little baking stations where all the ingredients are already out there and ready and they can do their baking. And they have like a mini oven, it's very cute. Oh my God. <laughs> And, um, and how it works is that there are two guides and a child can go up and get something from the shelf and the guide, if it's the very first time they've ever picked something up from the shelf, this particular thing, the guide will give them and basically an instruction in how to use it. And then the next time they get it out, the child will generally just use it themselves. And so they'll go up and take things out of the shelf there are many tables and chairs around the room. They go and put it down on the table. They sit down on their little chair. They use it. They um, like take all the pieces out the puzzle and they work on putting them all back in, working out where everything goes. Oh yes, very nice. Then when they feel ready to move on to the next thing, they'll pick it up, go put it back on the shelf and then they'll find something else that they would like to do, go and sit down. And it's the whole three hour uninterrupted period where they flow and they're working on whatever it is they want to work on. And they might spend three hours working on the same thing. So it might mm -hmm. be a three hour period where someone is making some bread and that's all they do for the three hours. They make one thing of bread. It might be three hours where someone is working on their, they have dressing boards where you learn to like buttons and zips and oh. um, duffel. Yeah. I was gonna say duffel coat, it's not. It's a duffel button. How would you describe that? A duffel, duffel things. Anyway, they're learning to do that. those. Um, and it might be three hours they're just doing that. It might be three hours of they're going to clean the windows. Um, another wonderful, very sweet thing they do. Or it might be three hours of they do a tiny bit of everything. It might be just one of those days where they want to flow around the room. And then at the end of that three hour working period, they will move on to doing lunch. So they'll set the lunch table up and then they will work collaboratively together, make sure everything out is out on the table. They've got their plates, their cutlery out, all the glasses, take the water jugs over. And because there are big ones and little ones, uh, the youngest is probably around 15 or 18 months, somewhere between that. And the oldest will be maybe a three-year-old would be the maximum age in that uh, classroom. And the oldest ones will obviously be helping the younger ones, making sure that if something's really heavy, they'll go over and be like, do we need help to carry that? Like, we'll carry the water jugs. Um, if the little one drops something, the older ones will come over and it starts to become that rather than the guides giving an instruction and the guides showing how to use each thing, 
the older children start to show how to use each thing to the younger ones. And mm. that's when they say they know that it's time for the older ones to, to move on to mm. the next classroom is really when they're like, okay, they've, they know how to use everything in this room now because they can teach everyone else how to mm. use all these things. So it's time for them to, to go on and like now challenge themselves with more things and build on all the, all the knowledge that they've got from this room. And mm. they feel very confident that they can use everything now. Um, so yeah, it's a very, it's a very beautiful kind of collaborative learning environment that they have. I was going to say, because that sounds fantastic. And, you know, anyone that, you know, in university or school that's done a group project would maybe be thinking, that sounds horrible. Working with other children in school or people in university is really difficult. And again, you know, I, I feel like it's almost tied into what you were saying earlier, Luke, where you were like, oh, well, I would maybe avoid the things that I wasn't as interested in. I feel like we need to remember that our mindset is so very, you know, just, I guess, controlled, built, coloured by the system that we've grown up in, mm. you know? The only reason that group projects are difficult, you know, in high school, primary school, uni, is because we've never really been taught to work collaborative, uh, co uh, sort of collaboratively with each other, you know? I mean, we just get shoved together and get told, do this, and we've all got to achieve a grade, and actually, if you don't do as well as me, I'm going to be worse off for it, and so I'm going to be mad at you. Like, there's there's so many mm. unnecessary sort of stressors put on there, along with a lot of unnecessary rules as well. That was something that, you know, I could not deal with in school. It really, really bugged me. Just pointless rules. Like, the way that you were describing lunchtime there, Jessica, sounds fantastic. I hated the idea of having to go up with my tray and then sit in a certain space and not do this and not do that, and you're only allowed to do... No, thank you. Please just let me exist. Let can I go to the can I go to the toilet, please? Oh well, you should have gone and break. Well, I didn't need to go then. So uh, what what do you want me to do? Go and stand in the toilet and force myself to urinate when I don't need to? It, ridiculous. For me, toileting is this big thing, and that's one of the reasons that I. It's another reason why I was like very into Montessori education, um, is because I went to a lot of different schools growing up. Um, I went to. Like all in, I went to sort of seven different educational establishments. And one of them I went to was a Quaker school. And Quaker mm. education is very different to um, normal education as well. Because in Quakerism, which is a religion, if you don't know, we treat um, everybody as equal and adults are expected to treat children as equal as well which in very much in Montessori, we do that. We treat children as our equals. We talk to them as our equals. We talk to them as we would uh, speak to another adult. We don't use the children's language or mm. speak down to them. And we explain things to them. And when we needed to go to the toilet in Quaker school, we just said, I'm going to the toilet. Wow. Yeah. Scandalous. <laughs> that would have got me a detention. See you in a moment. Say, I'm and going then you go to the toilet. toilet. And then you come back. <laughs> cool. Um, Madness. Whereas I then transferred out to a to like the local comprehensive school. And I was shocked and astonished that I suddenly had to put my hand up when I needed the toilet and be denied. And I was like, are you not denying me? basic human right like yeah. this, this feels wrong this is not okay this does not this is this is very much not uh, appropriate right here and now um especially because like i have i have disabilities and that it's a whole thing for me it's a whole thing mm. um so it was really not good and it's something that in montessori in the in we start using the, the, the potty in the toilet very early on and toileting independence is really like baked into the school day. So the children mm. are very much like you learn to trust your body, learn to trust your feelings, deal with it yourself. So it's we're teaching you how you feel. If you feel like you need to go to the toilet, you go to the toilet. This is you. Like you know yourself. I do not tell you how you feel. 
right now. This is about you. So that's like, that's a really beautiful part of it that I wanted very much for my children, for them to be able to have that sense of self and to not Mm. have someone sort of stand over them and tell them something about themselves. Yeah. That their lived experience was, was in some way incorrect. I totally agree with what you're saying about it being basic human rights that those are just things that we don't afford to children we've done a, actually we've had a whole conversation about this actually look look and i on our sister show after dark which you can get on our patreon um we've spoken all about this about how we just don't treat children as people but you know having having met yours having having met rupert he's so independent if i could just say it. like that that one time I met him, I I was honestly enamored. I just watching just watching him wander around, do his own thing. You, I'm you know I know lots of babies and children. Don't ask why. I just do. I know lots of babies and children, and not a single one of them has ever been so just content at doing their own thing, happy to be like no. Um, I'm gonna go this way, you know. There's, it's not a sort of jingle your keys in front of them to make them to make sure they're still, ex- they're, you know, they're still excited and not crying. If he's if he's bored, he's just he's off, you know. He's I'm 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 going over here. I'm gonna have to see what's going on over this way. I find that fantastic. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he didn't really um, he didn't like cry much as a child or anything. He's he's very he's very much like that now. So nowadays, mm. if if we're like in the kitchen we're cooking and chatting he'll just be like i'm going upstairs to play (laughs) (laughs) okay (laughs) bye then (laughs) she's just gone (laughs) sure i love that bye bye, darling bye bye Um, he'll be up there for an hour and a half and we're like should we check on our child or what do we what do we do in this no okay we'll just leave him Cool. Yeah, yeah. He, he is pretty good at that. He's great. You can send him on a plane for like hours. Just give him some little figures and he'll talk to them and make them talk to each other and give him a book and he's hours. Yeah, he's very into, he's very independent. That's something that um, Montessori education and Montessori parenting very mm-hmm. much fosters is that, is that independence, both of the kind of spirit and independent play. <laughs> Ding-a-ling-a-ling, is that the ad bell? Dong, ad. That, that's not what the ad bell sounds Dong, like. Dong, ad. Well, while Luke's doing whatever he's doing, I'll tell you about Sci Guys Live in London, which is only a week away or more or less, depending on when you are listening to this. You get your tickets at scyguys.co.uk forward slash tickets. And if they get a ticket, look, what do they get? Well, they get to come to a live recording or watch a live recording of the show. They get a Q&A. Some lucky people will come up on stage and do a quick fire quiz. And they get to meet and greet us after. And they get to see our brand new merch which no one's ever seen other than me they also get to buy and keep the merch if they so choose they can also see our special guest who will be joining us for the live podcast and as luke alluded to earlier if you can't make it to london and you're crying and you're trying to skip this ad right now don't don't do it because we have digital tickets available for anyone who doesn't want to come to london who can't make it to london or who just doesn't want to be that close to luke trust me it's not as fun as it seems my wife will be buying all of those tickets <laughs> let's get on with the show <laughs> <laughs> not before we tell them that scyguys.co.uk forward slash tickets and that patrons of ours get a 20 percent discount now let's get on with the show so i don't think we've spoken about um discipline yet jessica is there anything you could tell us about discipline um with a sort of montessori style yeah so interestingly um montessori kind of style of discipline is probably the aspect that is the most different i would say mm. from other styles of parenting especially um i think if you're going to like an alternative school people expect that it will be different that the way your teacher treats you is is a bit different mm. um but when it's your actual like your mums and you're out and about um and particularly with our friends that's the part that that comes across as the most the most different the most weird the most out there is that uh, for us we don't do uh, discipline in the way that we normally think of in the negative sense so we don't do the kind of like bad naughty um, punishments but we also don't do 
a huge amount of praising children. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of twofold, both because uh, there's an awareness in Montessori that the behaviors that we often see in children as being you know, bad and negative are behaviors that exist for a reason. So mm-hmm. why is a child dropping food on the floor repeatedly? Well, it's not because they want to be naughty. It's not because they are punishing us, the parent, because we made a meal that they didn't like, even though they told us they didn't like it last week. It's most often because they are really enjoying dropping stuff right now, (laughs) actually. And they really want to see what happens. Like, if they drop a bigger handful, does it fall in the same way? Is it going to splat again? Oh, if they drop a tiny bit, what exactly happens? If you throw it, does something different happen than if you just open your hand? This is fascinating. Wow, amazing. And it's our job as the parent to see this and be like, oh, you are really into dropping things right now. Okay. (laughs) Someone needs to take these kids to the Leaning Tower of Pisa with a feather and a bowling ball. Can I just say, I've been to the Leaning Tower of Pisa disappointing not very big not terribly leany well well you heard it here first same same they also don't let you take things up there and drop them off oh what (laughs) what is this woke nonsense so then what what i would do would be like aha okay i need to come up with a way for you to be dropping stuff Mm -hmm. that is like really interesting to you and is meeting this need right here and now um but in the moment we're going to be like ah We don't drop food. Food goes in your mouth or on the plate. And they're like, okay. And we repeat it, we repeat it. And like, so if you're having trouble with this, we're going to take the plate away right now Mm -hmm. and we'll bring it back later when you're not having this problem. And they're like, okay. And we do this enough times that the child, it starts to sink in. Food goes in your mouth or on the plate. And he still repeats it now. Like if he... If he sees food on the table, he's like, oh, no, food goes in the mouth or on the plate. And we're like, oh, yes, it does. You're mm. right. Sorry. Mm. We put your bread roll next to your plate. You're quite correct. How silly of us. Um, so what we would have done in that situation is make sure he had something like a big tub of um, different sized balls, balls made of different things that he could like pick up and drop or maybe rice that he could practice pouring and scooping and pouring Mm. so that he could really be meeting that inner need to learn more about how you pour things and drop things. So it's really about kind of going back to like, why? Why do children do these things? Mm. Um, But so again, the the language that you would be using when they're doing things, instead of um, run when they're running in the house, it's rather than yelling like, oh, we don't... No running in the house. Oh, you're being so naughty. Um, it's, we don't run in the house. You can go outside and run, but we don't mm-hmm. run in the house. It's, we don't use, we wouldn't use things like, you're naughty because we're putting words on that child. We don't, we wouldn't want our child to be internalizing words that we're giving them, that we're saying about them. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We try never to put any words on our child in that way because it's such a pressure, right? Even if the words are very positive, if it's, you're so smart, you're so clever, you're so brilliant, you're so intelligent. They're like, oh my God, wow, oof, okay, oh my God. And then they start struggling with something and they're like, oh, am I, I thought I was clever, I thought I was intelligent, I thought I was brilliant, but I'm really struggling with this. I'm just not gonna do it. Yeah. And I won't, my brilliance, my intelligence won't be tested. Okay. Ooh. All right. I won't do that. Never mind. Out of interest, when you're, for example, you have your kid have a load of stuff to drop because they are sort of experimenting, right? They're testing gravity. How does it work? Um, when you get to the end of that activity, do you, does the kid help you tidy that up? Uh, Is that like another part of the activity to go like, well, when we've then made a mess, we have to clear it up together. Is that part of it as well? Yes, absolutely. He helps tidy all of his things. Mm. It's not, um, 
it's not on me to tidy all of his stuff away. It's very much, we always include him in tidying things and we have since he was really tiny. Mm. Like, even mm. before he could actually physically tidy mm. things, <laughs> we made him feel like he was part of the tidying process. <laughs> so that now that he can tidy his things, he does. So one of his favorite games is uh, he has a world map um, on, a, on a mat really big mat that he lies down on the floor and a whole box of these little um, animals which are amazing schleck animals highly recommend they <laughs> look like really like perfect actual animals and he puts the animals down on the parts of the world that the animals come from okay. so like where does a rhino come from where does a, a lion come from and he puts it down on the different um, countries or continents that they come from um, which is one of his favourite things to do and at the end of that game, there were obviously animals spread across this map. And so part of the game afterwards, when he's finished it, is that he likes to then pick them up and put them back into the box. And that's now, he thinks, part of the game. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. Which, it, it makes sense, though. I was going to say that this is where that seems to align a lot with gentle parenting for me, you know, with that sort of... Um, discipline aspect of not saying you're naughty but really thinking about the the, the needs of the child because again I, I don't know if you mentioned this sort of explicitly um, but kids can't regulate their emotions necessarily all that well mm. they don't necessarily know what it is that they want or need so yeah as you were saying if a kid is doing something it's your job as a as a parent or as an adult or as a carer or as just a person that's around to help them sort of meet that need in a safe way, in a healthy way, in a way that isn't going to damage them or anyone around them. And I really, I really love this aspect of sort of, you know, um, natural consequences almost, right? So if it's, you make a mess, you clean up the mess. If you, okay, we're, we don't, um, you know, we don't run in the house. Well, why don't we run in the house? Well, because if we run in the house, we can fall over and hurt ourselves so we can run outside, right? Explaining why the things why the rules exist because that was something that always bothered me i something that still bothers me is give me a rule that is pointless that you can't explain that there's no reason for why should i follow that rule mm. like if you can't tell me why i should follow the rule why should i follow the rule and okay yes there might be things that i don't understand but in that case then i've got that trust built up with you wherein everything you've told me up until this point is true and i trust you and i understand why so if there's if you tell me okay well here's this rule and i'm going to try to explain it to you and if you don't quite understand it you know well you know maybe when you're older or whatever maybe it's not something that you're able to do right now i'll do my best to explain it like as the kid in that situation i'm like well okay i trusted you with everything else so why would i not trust you here whereas if you're not explaining any rules to a kid it's just like it, it's just a, it's just you're telling them off and they don't understand why and i think that's something people don't remember about kids is that if you sort of get them in trouble if you discipline them that way they don't necessarily understand why they're getting in trouble why you've changed i heavily agree and one of the things that we have is like we didn't really do kind of any baby proofing mm. um because the world outside is not baby proofed mm -hmm. so if i'm teaching you in like a fake sense the this idea of safety in our house like sure you can just run around and, yeah. and everything is fine and safe and you can bash into the corner of this table and it's not really going to hurt you because i've put some kind of sticky um like a bouncy plastic thing onto yeah. it <laughs> um what am i teaching you when we're out and about you're going to run around anyway and think you can mm -hmm. bash into some other tables and they are not going to have that plastic thing on so instead here is our house it has breakable things that are very easily accessible to him, like here, um, <laughs> most emotions to breakable things, um, <laughs> and many like bits of china, many um, sharp corners of table, and he learns. Oh, okay. Like I know not to run here. I know to duck here. I know that I need to be gentle when I'm touching things that feel this way. So when I mm -hmm. go to someone else's house, because other people's houses aren't baby proof, they don't have a baby. I know mm -hmm. that if I touch something and it feels delicate, that I should be respectful and gentle and caring with it and make sure that I put it down and be like, oh, 
That feels a bit. That feels a bit gentle. Have you ever seen a dog with an egg in its mouth? <laughs> Like a Labrador. Yeah. If you hand an egg to a dog, like they really gently, they in, for, whether it's intuitive or not, I don't know, but they really gently like put their mouth around it really softly and like carry it and put it down softly. I will, I will say it's not all dogs. There are a good number of dogs I know that would absolutely destroy that egg oh, immediately. Okay. But... <laughs> I've been lied to by TikTok. Damn you, TikTok. So we, we have a no-no cupboard under the stair, under the sink, which has like cleaning things in. Mm. Um. And we were like, that's the no-no cupboard. That's the no-no cupboard. And uh, it did have a lock on it. That was the one cupboard that we had a lock on. And he was like, that's the no-no cupboard. That's the no-no cupboard. So he's learned just the, the term no-no. So now if we do go somewhere and we need to immediately stop him because there is something actually dangerous mm -hmm. and we're like, oh, that we didn't see coming... Um, it, we like to over explain ahead of time we can be like okay we're going to this place there may be X there that may be dangerous you're going to walk to the corner of this road a car may come these things may happen but obviously when you're out and about anything can happen we mm -hmm. need him to react quickly we need to be like that's a no-no and he can go oh okay mm -hmm. and he's like oh hands in not sure what's going on but I'll just freeze unclear mm -hmm. I'll wait for further direction <laughs> all right then um, and so in those moments, I need him to have something rather than being able to be using the word no really frequently. Mm -hmm. And so it has no meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I feel like, you know, there might be people listening to this that are thinking, oh, well, uh, you know, I couldn't do that with my kid because they just wouldn't listen. And maybe, you know, they're, they're you know, I'm going to say, not going to say this is universal, going to work for every child. But I think the thing that I found in reading about this is that it is adaptable to, you know, sort of almost any individual, right? You've you've got to work with, you know, the individual that you're working with, the child that you're working with. But um, you know, a lot of this comes through trust, right? I mean, if you if you think about it, you know, if from the the minute that this child is born, you are instilling that you know, they're you're sort of instilling that trust in them. You're you're teaching them all of these things, you're you're guiding them in that way. They're obviously gonna be sort of acting and responding differently to a child that hasn't been brought up with that level of trust that's sort of that's been in a more sort of authoritarian parenting mm. which is essentially you know i'm an authority figure so you do what i say you don't question that which to be honest per i think it's a very poor way of um of getting someone to do something in general you know because naturally they're going to be curious people and they're going to be people that ask those questions and you don't get the understanding of why you should and shouldn't be doing things. Mm -hmm. uh, and just one other thing I'd want to mention as well is that obviously, you know, um, this there, there have seen things about this being something that isn't necessarily super accessible to everyone because a lot of Montessori schools obviously are paid. Um, and it is something that does probably take quite a, quite a lot of sort of self-control, self-regulation. You've got to regulate your own emotions. If a child does something that is like, you know, let's say they smash the TV, that's quite upsetting. You need to be able to take that time and not react immediately. And some people might not necessarily feel they've got the capacity for that. So I just want to put out there that whilst we're talking about all of the, all of the benefits of this, we're not saying that it's equally easy for everyone. And there may be some, you know, more systemic barriers to people sort of accessing this. So I do completely agree. There are a lot of um, amazing, uh, there are a lot of amazing Instagram accounts that are based around making Montessori like affordable and accessible in a home environment. So rather than sending children to Montessori schools, which are often, as you say, fee paying, although mm -hmm. there are some in America, which are, um, I mean, they call them publicly funded uh, in America, mm -hmm. but yeah. there are those. There is a way you can still do it at home and it doesn't have to be the most expensive thing because you don't have to have the like wooden Montessori mm -hmm. materials that are the exact thing. They can be made out of boxes. You can make things with your own materials. A lot of it is about your um, approach to things and your own relationship with your mm -hmm. child and teaching them how they 
then go out and experience the world. Mm. Although there is a lot of reparenting, I would say, involved mm-hmm. in Montessori parenting. If if you are a first generation Montessori parent, if you haven't done, <laughs> you know, if you didn't go to Montessori yourself, there's a lot of it that you're like, whoa, I wish, <laughs> I wish this had been me. Um, and coming to understand, have like a deeper understanding of yourself through it, I'd definitely say. Absolutely. And I mean, just sort of the last thing I'd want to touch on here is the effectiveness of this, the actual science behind it, because we spent so much long talking about this. And bear in mind a lot of this, I mean, this is grounded in, you know, sort of um, this doctor's work with children. So, you know, while we're not talking specifically about studies, there is that sort of, um, you know, data there to some degree. But actually recently there has been there's been there been sort of there's been more data um coming out that kind of shows that montessori education is potentially more beneficial than more traditional methods of education in a number of ways you know um emotional regulation adult well-being i mean all of these are linked in the description we don't necessarily have time to go through them all now maybe we could do another episode where we dig deeper into these but um while it's not necessarily definitive that's because it's really difficult to study because to get to really study this you'd want to set up randomized controls and that's a really difficult thing to do for a number of reasons that we've already mentioned you know the unethical fact that, well yeah well not necessarily that it's just unethical but there are other factors there i mean the fact that so many um those sort of montessori schools are fee paying sure that then creates conf- confounding factors there i mean if you try and find certain people it might be certain areas for example washington dc is you know is really popular there but there might be sort of confounding factors of people that live in Washington, D.C. specifically that, um, you know, that might make them have those sort of outcomes where others wouldn't. But um, as far as I'm aware, the evidence that seems to be coming out, um, again, all linked in the the description, shows that, you know, there's better storytelling abilities, uh, better emotional well-being as adults, uh, generally just sort of better academic performance. And this is for uh, boys and girls as well. It's that, you know, there's no there's no sort of difference there. Um, And I also want to say as well, people often see this as sort of a white person thing, but there's evidence showing that it does work for Latino kids and black kids, which is something that seems ridiculous to say, but I I do have to say it because this is something that has been brought up in a few of the studies that I've been looking at, you know? Uh, But yeah, no, absolutely. Montessori parenting, Montessori education, it it seems to be a better method, which, I mean, obviously, um, treating a child as a person, who'd have thought that would work? (laughs) <laughs> yeah it is also a global educational method um which which and it has schools all across the world as well mm. and it is wonderful to see how diverse um montessori schools can be because it again as a global educational method one of the great things is that you can if you're a family who needs to travel across the world you can have your child be in a montessori school in one country and then move to a different country and put your child in a Montessori school there and they'll still be able to to very quickly adapt to the Mm. environment because Mm -hmm. they know it very well, Uh, which is another great bonus of Montessori is that it very easily can be applied across the world and to different cultures. It's very much part of the framework is about growing your child into someone who is part of their culture and Mm -hmm. who respects their culture um it isn't about they need to be part of this very specific way of life that fits into this one country and then we apply it to everyone else it's about how do we make this framework fit where the child is in the here and now i think that's the episode and thank you very much for joining us that was brilliant if i do say so that was quite a fun conversation thanks so much uh, for having me this has been a, a wonderful time chatting to you oh, yeah that was great well that is all from us but before we go we'd like to thank all of our patrons with an extra special thank you to executive producers Danito and glitch rabbit and thank you for watching you can find the full references for this episode down in the description subscribe for new episodes every sunday and why not leave us a nice wee comment support the pod at patreon.com forward slash sci guys or you can find and go on that desert sci guys pod on twitter facebook instagram youtube and at sci guys on tiktok too <gasps> Or you can send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod at gmail.com. You can follow me at NotCore everywhere. You can follow me at Luke Cupford everywhere. You can follow me on YouTube at Jessica Carbon Fazard or on Instagram and TikTok at Jessica Closet. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much.